G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. In this video, we're going to talk about foam in oil. Specifically, we're going to talk about the types of air that you might find in an oil system. We'll talk about how bubbles form. And we'll briefly touch on the causes of excessive foam. Although troubleshooting and all that kind of stuff, I'm going to leave to a separate video. All right, so let's talk about the types of air in oil. Specifically, we want to talk about entrainment versus foam. So if you imagine an oil reservoir, um, you might have dissolved air in that uh, oil system. Perfectly normal. You won't be able to see it. Um, not really harming anyone. Then you've got what we call entrained air. So bubbles and pockets of air within the oil system that aren't breaking out to the surface, but they're just kind of held in suspension. This can be quite dangerous, and I'll have to do a separate video um, on how to troubleshoot this kind of stuff, because you can get micro-dieseling, you can get um, hydraulic actuators not functioning correctly, um, we can get, you know, uh, low head for a, a centrifugal pump, um, we can get cavitation, there's all kinds of stuff that can happen when you have a lot of entrained air. So a little bit is, is normal, but a lot of entrained air can become a problem. When we talk about foam, we are specifically talking about bubbles that are forming on the surface. So at the oil-air kind of interface. Um, and generally, when we talk about foaming as a problem, it's when there is a lot of stable foam. Now, foam itself is generally a cosmetic problem. It generally isn't going to cause a problem for your oil system. But there are cases where excessive foam causes you know, the foam to spill out of the oil reservoir onto the floor, that can be a problem. Obviously, there's slip hazards and all kinds of stuff. Um, it can also be a problem if there is so much foam um, that it starts to suck air into your application. That can be a problem. So it, it can be a concern, but generally a small amount of foam is kind of normal. All right, so let's talk a little bit about bubbles. Not this kind of bubble, obviously. Uh, we're talking about these kinds of bubbles, the bubbles that you kind of played with as a kid. Um, so if you have kids, or if you have ever been a kid, so that's everyone, you will have played with bubbles at some point, and you will have relished the idea of popping them. Now, have you, as a kid, ever tried to blow bubbles just using water? Right? Because if you have, the result probably wasn't very good. You need a little bit of detergent in the water um, to make it form stable bubbles. So why is that? It all comes down to surface tension. So let's explore this idea of surface tension. And let's talk about water for starters, and then we'll, we'll talk about oil. So the water molecule itself is H2O. Oxygen shares valence electrons with the hydrogen. But when we say it shares, it's, it's not an equal share, right? So the oxygen tends to hold on to the electrons more so than the hydrogen. And what that causes is what we call a net dipole across the water molecule. That means that the oxygen has a net negative charge and the hydrogen has a net positive charge. Okay, so there is a difference in charge across the molecule. And when water forms ice, it's able to form this distinct crystalline structure because positively charged hydrogens bond loosely to negatively charged oxygens. And this is what we call a hydrogen bond. Now in ice, it forms a regular crystalline structure. But in water, we still have some hydrogen bonding. It's just intermittent. So as the, as the molecules slide past each other, the hydrogens and oxygens interact in an electromagnetic way. What this is talking about is the intermolecular forces of water, and these give rise to surface tension. All right, so now we come to blowing bubbles. And in order to get this to happen, you of course need some detergent. <clears throat> so when you blow bubbles, you're forcing air through this membrane, and it is going to form a bubble. Now, why is it 
that all bubbles are circular, right? All bubbles are circular, right? Any that you've ever seen, they're always these perfect spheres. And that's got to do with the, uh, well, it's a, it's a concept that was brought about by Laplace of trying to reduce the amount of surface tension. So it forms what we call a minimal surface. So all bubbles are spheres, right? Well, obviously not. Depending on the shape, it will form a, the bubble will form a shape that will minimize the surface area and therefore minimize the surface tension. All right. So now let's talk about the relative surface tension and its effect on foam stability. So at the top, you've got water. On the bottom, you have what we would call pure paraffinic molecules. I've been into this before, but effectively, if you have molecules that are only made out of carbon and hydrogen, carbon and hydrogen share electrons very equally, and so there is no net dipole across those. So there's, there's no polarity. And so that's why PAO synthetics are very, very nonpolar. Now, mineral oils sit closer to a PAO, but they are often a little bit polar because they have things like nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, phosphorus contained in them, right? So there's impurities. All right, so on this scale, as we go up, we are increasing the intermolecular forces. And what that means in practical terms is that we are increasing the surface tension. Now, at the very top, we have too much surface tension to form a stable bubble. So you can think of the surface as being like almost brittle in that instance. So we tr we're trying to pump air into it and it just breaks. At the low end, we have too little surface tension. So the, the, bubble, the bubble film will be too thin and it will break easily. And this is why PAOs and particularly metallocene PAOs um, have extremely good foam performance. Somewhere in the middle, we have this Goldilocks zone where we can form stable foam bubbles, right? So mineral oils generally sit below that and they have pretty decent foam performance. And the foam performance increases as you go from a group one to a group three because they get less polar. Now, we can stabilize foam. This is obviously not something we want to do, but if we add polar contaminants or soaps to mineral oil. So this is why, for example, grease contamination is so bad for foam performance because grease thickeners are soaps, right? They're polar molecules which increase the surface tension of the mineral oil and enable it to form stable foam bubbles. Similarly, polar contaminants. So if you have a contaminant with, with metals or in particular silicon, that can increase the stable levels of foam. Now, how do we decrease the amount of foam in a mineral oil? Well, we add anti-foam particles. Now, anti-foam particles are generally uh, silicon polymers or acrylate um, polymers. And what these are is very, very low surface tension substances that are attracted to the air oil interface, right? So what they're gonna want to do is reduce the surface tension so that foam bubbles are not stable. All right, so that's been a very quick introduction to how foam forms in oil. A couple of pointers on maybe how we can troubleshoot, but troubleshooting excessive foam is something I'll go into more detail in with a future video. This has been Lubrication Explained. As usual, if you've got questions or comments, leave them below.